You're now listening to the Tax Smart REI Podcast, the number one tax podcast for real estate investors. Hey, thanks for tuning into this week's episode of the Tax Smart REI Podcast. Today, Ryan and I are joined with real estate attorney Ron Rohde to discuss what you need to know about LLCs, including what are LLCs to begin with, a breakdown of common LLC structures. We answer the question, do you really need a complex entity structure to protect your assets? We cover strategies to avoid piercing the corporate veil. We answer the question, is umbrella insurance really a replacement for LLCs? We discuss LLC mistakes and more. We also then dive into Ron's experience as he transitioned from residential to industrial real estate investing. So whether you already have LLCs or you're planning to create one, this is an episode you don't want to miss. We'll be diving into all that in just one minute. Hey, are you ready to discover how to use real estate to build tax-free wealth? Well, this year we're taking our annual summit to the next level by incorporating wealth building strategies alongside our traditional tax and legal insights. Thus, we proudly introduce the 2024 Tax, Legal, and Wealth Summit for real estate investors taking place May 17th, 18th, and 19th right from the comfort of your own home. This extraordinary free three-day virtual event is meticulously designed to arm you with the strategies the 1% use to cultivate tax-free wealth through real estate. Whether you want to build, safeguard, or grow your wealth, this summit is your golden ticket. Visit www.taxandlegalsummit.com to reserve your free tickets today. Again, that's www.taxandlegalsummit.com to reserve your free tickets. We'll see you there, but for now, we'll dive right into today's episode. Hey, Ron, thanks for joining us today. I know you've done a number of things here on the show and for Tax Smart Insiders, but for people who might be new or maybe miss some of those, would you be able to give our listeners just a brief overview of your background and kind of how you got into real estate and real estate law? Yeah, absolutely, Tom. It's good to be back and good to meet Ryan. My name's Ron. I have my own commercial real estate investing law firm. And all we do is help investors maximize their investment with transactional work. So PSAs, amendments, and leasing. So that's what I do in my day job. But you know, I'm somebody that just can't get enough of real estate investing. It's all I talk about to my wife. It's all I personally invest in. And what we're here today is to talk about LLCs. And I think that it is so popular. And the reason is because it's a necessity. It's that stepping stone. It's And it's important that it's step one of your real estate investing journey, which is that decision that I'm going to take this seriously. I'm going to make it big. I'm going to make it somewhat of a professionally run business. So we're going to talk about LLCs and really how every single investor needs it or at what point in their investment career do they need it. Awesome. Awesome. Before we get too far into the weeds of an LLC, could we kind of just start with briefly, what is an LLC and how does an LLC protect people's assets? Great question. An LLC, it's short for limited liability company. These are a relatively new, if you look at the history of law, you know, the last 500 years or something, they're relatively new, only around for 30 or 40 years. But the LLC is a state regulated entity that the government issues. And what it does is it limits your liabilities to the assets of the LLC. And that's really important because the alternative way of investing is essentially a sole proprietorship or your individual name, where if I do something on an investment property and somebody gets hurt, they can sue me personally and go after all of my assets, including my house, my cars, my dog, you know, they're going to seize everything that is not protected in bankruptcy. And so these limited liability companies, they're a great creation because it really spurs the economy and and it lets people say, I'm going to risk capital. I'm going to invest in something. Maybe I'm going to rehab this house. Maybe I'm going to buy this foreclosure tax lien, pay back the county, give them their back taxes, but I'm only going to do it on the assumption that my liability is limited to the equity that I put into this single property. And, you know, I think in terms of society, it's a fair trade because there would be a lot less economic activity if investors were always personally at risk, unlimited liability for every single investment. So LLC, it's a state registered or state chartered entity. It's a separate legal entity, which we'll get into that a little bit of why it's important that it's a separate entity and how to keep that. But you know, that's essentially what it is. You're creating a separate entity to hold assets, to conduct business, to pay distributions, and it protects you while you're growing and you have lots and lots of different real estate properties. Speaking of protection, something that commonly comes up is something like an umbrella insurance policy. 
So could you maybe just briefly walk through what's the main difference between protection with an LLC compared to something like an umbrella insurance policy? You know, umbrella is a great tool, um, you know, for the cost. It's what, three, 500 bucks a year for 2 million of coverage. Everybody should have that. That is really just for your personal life. But an umbrella policy doesn't replace LLC coverage because they're just two different approaches to protecting your assets. You know, I'm not sure if you've ever had the pleasure of filing insurance claims, but insurance companies aren't really in the business of paying out on claims. They don't make money by paying out everything that you've paid in. And so for that reason, you have to assume that insurance is not there. I think insurance is a second bite at the apple. It's really, a, you know, umbrella policy is designed to be a secondary catch-all, but you can't go into a situation expecting to use a shield, which is, I think, flimsy at best. And so that's the difference is when you structure a deal with an LLC, you're going in and saying, I am protected. The umbrella becomes a, okay, if things get really crazy, I have a backup plan, but you can't go in to a battle, you know, relying on the umbrella. That's really a secondary approach. And I recommend both. I mean, I have umbrella coverage because I might be driving my car and I hit, you know, somebody in the street or any types of thing can happen. Defamation claims. Now we're seeing a lot of social media. We saw Trump in the news. If you get hit with a defamation lawsuit, umbrella would cover those types of damages. Maybe not 90 million, but that's exactly what it would cover. And so it sounds like an umbrella policy is not necessarily a substitution for an LLC, long story short. Right. The only caveat to that is maybe when you're very first starting off, when you're investing a low amount of equity with your personal assets, you don't have a lot of personal assets. Some people can start buying a rental house in their name plus umbrella, but that is really a very risky proposition to start. And, and I only recommend it if that's the only thing that you can do and that's preventing you from getting started. But very quickly after that first investment, you should pivot over into the LLC structure. And that kind of brings me into another good question. So we know Aaron, everybody I'm sure who's listened to this show, there's a million and one LLC structures out there, there's recommendations, packages, all this crazy stuff. Um, you know, in terms of LLC structures, what are some typical structures that make sense for real estate investors or rental property investors, I guess, more specifically? And then how do investors know which one would be the right one perhaps for them? Yeah, it's a great question because it kind of gets to the heart of what being a real estate investor is. These are the decisions that investors have to make, which is how much of a service do I consume when there's no guidebook, there's no playbook. And I'll go through a couple LLC structures and then we'll talk about which ones are best for certain people. But I think at the most basic level, you own a property, say in Texas, I'm, I'm here in Dallas, you own one residential house in Dallas and you put it in a Texas LLC. That is step one, that's LLC, you know, asset protection 101. It's sufficient, gets the job done, it's cheap, costs about 1500 bucks and it provides you with a minimum level of protection and it's suitable for anybody that has built up a little bit of equity you know you take into account debt pay down or maybe you know you have a lot of money in a brokerage account so that's very basic but it gets the job done level two would be same texas llc but owned by a wyoming llc maybe a delaware llc maybe a nevada llc because it, let's say you go with the Wyoming route, you're going to get anonymity protection baked in, you're going to get good charging order, and you're inserting more layers. So this is kind of a sidebar, but the whole goal with asset protection and LLCs in general, it's not to make yourself invincible. We've seen with the Panama Papers and, and no matter who you are, it's not to be 100% protected. It's to prevent barriers. It's to put barriers in front of people that want to sue you and otherwise get at your assets, but they're not going to do it when they're getting paid on contingency. And so with that in mind, I think it's really important that the goal is not to create this beautiful castle that is, you know, impenetrable, right? It's not the Fort Knox. What we're doing is saying you have this treasure, we're going to put one wall between you and the outside army people that are banging at the gates. And for most people, you know, they say, what's inside? Well, it's $50,000. I'm not going to spend that much time trying to scale this wall or to break it down. 
And when that nest egg, it grows and now it's 150 K you say, well, Ron, you know, I don't want just one little fence in between. Let's use a fence analogy, which, which is good. It keeps things out, keeps good things in and not bad things out. But when you add the Wyoming, you're adding another wall. And so now you've got this little simple fence, which is functional and it works, but now you've added a brick wall and it's really starting to take some shape. And again, it's going to be suitable for a lot of people, but the questions that I go through with my clients is not just, do you want an LLC or what's the best structure? Because two individuals, Ryan and Tom, might own the exact same assets, the same amount of homes, same equity, same everything, and the dollar amount is the same. But Tom might be more risk loving and he's like, I'm fine with just one LLC, throw it all in there, I'm okay. But Ryan, he's got a wife, he's got kids, you know, he's a little bit more risky in, in other areas. He says, I want more protection to help me sleep at night because that's just a personal preference. And so I say that because I think for people listening, you have to balance with what everybody's saying out there. We know there's tons of gurus and TikTok videos and Instagram about do this and put this and land trust and revocable this and trust inside an LLC that owns another LLC that's managed with the beneficiary. That's fine. Those are all suitable defensive positions. But the question really comes down to what is your individual risk tolerance for what you need? And don't let some of the salespeople who make more money off of you tell you what you need as a minimum. And so those are some common structures. You know, you can substitute that initial LLC for a trust entity. That's good if you have debt on there and you may be subject to do on sale clause. But that's, I guess, three different structures that are very common. And, you know, the costs range from 1500 to 35 or 5,000 bucks. And I can't tell you what's reasonable. You know, if you have 30,000 or 50,000 a year of free cash flow, does it make sense to spend 10% of that on asset protection? Yes, probably if your, your net worth is $3 million and it's somewhat liquid. But if your net worth is $1 million, or 500,000 and you've got 50,000 of cash flow. It's a very different calculus. I hope that answers your question, Tom, but those are some scenarios. That's roughly the cost. And you've just got to make that decision with your attorney and with your CPA about what is the annual compliance cost of doing these extra disregarded entities. They are passed through, but it does complicate your return a little bit. That certainly does answer the question. I appreciate that breakdown because it's not a one size fits all bucket. I have a quick question about like Wyoming or Nevada LLCs. I know Ryan has a question about something too, but with Wyoming and Nevada LLCs, they're said to have better asset protection than perhaps other states. How much weight does that actually hold in practice, like in the real world? I think it does. I think it's a real tangible difference when you're dealing with those states compared to if we just pick a random South Dakota, okay, I would 100%, I'm say guarantee, but 99%, I guarantee you, two identical lawsuits will have different outcomes if the LLCs are in those other states. And again, like most litigation, it's probably going to end in some type of settlement. But if the amount of the controversy is a million dollars, your insurance company will be in a better position to settle for less money if it's in a Wyoming because they say, even if you win everything that you're saying, you're limited in your recovery of you know 800,000. So even if you win everything, you're only going to get eight. So therefore we'll settle for 400 you know, or 300. If you have just a run of the mill kind of non-specific state like South Dakota, picking on them, Maybe the plaintiff's attorney is going to say, I'm going to get 900,000 or a million out of a million if I get this thing all the way, because I can completely take over the LLC. I can step into the loan. I can do all these things. And, and I'm going to control that asset with no limitations. The insurance company will settle for 500,000 or 600,000 because what they're saying is true. So my answer is it does apply in the all the way logical conclusion of disagreement or a dispute. However, where you are likely to end up on that spectrum of a, of a lawsuit does relate back to current settlement negotiations. So you lose a little bit of the definition, you know, the clarity of that, but 
it does have impacts all the way back to, you know, day one of a lawsuit, or even if there's a lawsuit filed, you know, that's, that's something that I try to tell people too, is you want to put good walls in defense early so that people are discouraged from even trying. That's, that's the best war, right? And it's probably Sun Tzu's art of war somewhere. He says the best war is the war not fought. And that's what some LLC asset protection can do because the guy looking at the case says, I don't know what's behind that wall. I don't even know who owns it. It's anonymous. It could be, you know, poor Tom over there with no pennies to his name, or it could be Ryan Moneybags over there, and we should launch an attack because it's worth it. The juice is worth the squeeze. So that's another big part, I think, is anonymity and shielding who it is so they can't just go on Google. I mean, these plaintiff's attorneys, right, they take all these cases on contingency. Nobody's really just footing an hourly bill. And so when they take it on contingency, they have 10 or 15 different cases on their desk, all with the similar damages, all with similar facts, uh, pros and cons. But when they can't identify who the owner is, if it's a doctor, that's a surgeon that's making a million dollars a year, you know that if you get a million dollar judgment, he is going to pay just like kind of as a statement. But if it's Ryan and, you know, he doesn't have, or Tom, Tom's the poor one, he doesn't have any money. I might not sue Tom because even if I win, I'm not sure that I'm going to get paid. And so I'm going to push his file to the side. I'm going to focus on slam dunks because that's, that's kind of what lawyers have to do in terms of risk assessment. And so that's a real benefit of some of those states that you mentioned. So Delaware, Wyoming, when they're anonymous and you have to do a lot of work to subpoena the secretary of state, to issue depositions, when you have to do a lot of work just to get the answer of, oh crap, Tom owns this LLC, people won't undertake that cost because it's a risk. Interesting. Before we move on, we see a lot of entity structures that come our way, especially in the kind of consulting strategic side. And I have seen with a lot of them, attorneys recommend land trusts. Uh, you had kind of commented on that. So I was actually hoping you could help maybe me and our audience kind of understand why would an attorney for real estate investors, right? Why would they recommend a land trust? And it usually seems if I'm picturing diagrams I've seen in the past, it's like underneath the LLC in kind of the diagram, like why the land trust? What, what value does that add there? Yeah. Full disclosure, I guess I, I see a lot of the structures from some of the, the big players in our field, you know, that, that are online and, and they charge an arm and a leg, but I won't claim to have the exact same view that they do. But in my perspective, the trusts are good at the lowest property level to avoid some of the due on sale or some of the transfer prohibitions. And so that's why you see the trust at the low level, at the asset ownership level. It avoids that due on sale. You change the beneficial owner via the ownership of the LLC, but you maintain some of that local control and you don't trigger the due on sale. You know, I think a trust is good for those circumstances, but it's kind of minimal in terms of complying with the actual spirit or the intent of the trust. And so I tend to take more of an LLC approach because I'm more comfortable with just business transactions as opposed to creating personal trusts for a single family. So maybe I'll clarify that too. I think trusts are a little bit better if it's a single owner, but when our clients have partners or you have investors, syndicators, for example, you're going to be in pure LLC world. You're not going to be doing a trust because you don't have that same ability to regulate the management of it because there's no clear operating agreement. There's no clear state law and lenders don't love it. So that's, again, a kind of a, a quick and dirty delineation between you should use a trust if it's just your own money and it's like single single owner. But if you have a partner or syndication, raise funds, or if you have plans to do that in the future, I think LLC is the business standard, right? That's what everybody uses. That's really helpful too, because correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like as well, if you're concerned about that, you know, doing a quick claim deed, say you got financing in your personal name, and now you're going to say, move this to a quick claim deed into an LLC, you might be concerned that, hey, 
the bank could say, hey, you transferred you know, a title of this property, and now we're going to use our due on sale clause, which is in so many of these loan documents. And now you've got some protection there because it sounds like you're basically still having it be owned by the trust, which essentially is you. And therefore, there is not that due on sale risk, if you want to call it that. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's okay. the theory. Um, minor quibble too, I'll say we don't like quick claim deeds. That's not the preferred way to affirmatively convey title. We would always do warranty deeds. So we want a special warranty deed to actively convey that interest, but sorry, minor technicality. <laughs> that's good. I, that's why you're here. <laughs> So we have like two more questions left on LLCs, then we're going to jump into Ron's experience with industrial investing, which is going to be super exciting. Hey, are you tired of working with generalist CPAs that tell you you can't use the real estate professional status, the short-term rental loophole, or cost segregation studies, or worse, have no idea what these things are? If so, it's time to elevate your game and work with a CPA firm that gets it. Here at Whole CPA, we've worked with thousands of investors, helping them save millions of dollars in taxes through proactive tax strategy and planning, tax preparation, and outsourced accounting solutions. So if you're ready to elevate your game, make tax filing painless, and save thousands of dollars in taxes, what are you waiting for? Just head on over to www.therealestatecpa.com slash podcast to request an initial consultation today. We are accepting clients for the 2023 and 2024 tax year, so if you're looking to make a change, you have nothing to lose. Again, you can request an initial consultation by visiting www.therealestatecpa.com slash podcast. We look forward to hearing from you and learning more about your situation and how we can help. But for now, we'll dive right back into today's episode. So we talked a lot today and you know, you, you clarified a tremendous amount of things, I think, for us and our listeners here. What are some common like mistakes that you see real estate investors make with LLCs? Yeah, that, and that's a softball question. Number one is management. 100%, I think it's head and shoulders above all the other mistakes, which is poor management. I really don't put as much effort or priority on these elaborate structures. I think put it in an LLC, put it in two LLCs, boom, boom, you're done. That nuance is less beneficial over the long run versus management. You've got to conduct business in the LLC's name if you don't know what that means, it's you know receiving income. It means signing contracts. It means issuing expenses. All of these things are really critical to create a habit of conducting business in the LLC's name. And I get it. I know it's hard. I mean, I'm I'm say I'm guilty of it, but I have a lot of LLCs personally myself, and sometimes it can be confusing. But I make my bookkeeper, who's a paid employee, I say, split this invoice. I say, reissue this invoice because I will get one big invoice from a contractor that worked on multiple jobs and he just sends me, you know, $10,000. I make my bookkeeper, I pay it, and then he will split out and reissue invoices and show paid invoices allocated to the properties pro rata or, or how it's divided. And I think. That's the key example that happens a lot. And you're going to get lazy. You're going to get busy. But when I get to the end of the year or I get to some point with a client and I ask them, show me your documentation of conducting business. And they've got nothing. You know, they're using a personal email. They're emailing about this property. They're emailing about that one. They say they're getting invoices issued to the wrong LLC, for example. And they say, oh, well, it's clear because you know RPL LLC is for my townhouse over in Fort Worth, but the invoice was issued to a different LLC with the wrong address. And to them, it's clear because it says residential job, it says roofing, whatever repair. And they say, well, clearly, you know, it's for that property, the address. And I say, no, it's it's not clear. You're creating confusion from a lawyer's perspective. I would love to get my hands on that invoice and point to it, you know, to pierce the corporate veil, as well as just kind of it's bad practice for bookkeeping, because a third party auditor, or even, you know, bookkeeping services or tax, they're going to see that invoice, and they're going to be confused, they're not going to know which one it applies to. And usually, and I'll speak for you guys, you're going to default to what the LLC is on the invoice and book it under the LLC, or would you try to book it under the property? Because maybe you don't even know who owns that property address. So that would be the, the issue. Yeah, I think for the most part, it depends on how we link up. If it's like a check that comes through, we might try to go back and get clarification from the client specifically where that goes. 
But by default, we would probably go with the LLC is if we're not sure if it's not linked to a specific property, just because, you know, it says the name of the LLC. So it really just depends, which I guess to your point though, Ron, is why it's super critical to, to kind of make sure the stuff is ironed out the proper way. Yeah, because I can see logically it going either way. Some contractor issues an invoice, maybe he did the wrong address. And maybe this roof job was for that LLC, but it was for a different property address. And so when you have a 50-50 mistake that could go either way, you can't let those things slide. And I'll tell you, it happens a lot. And it happens with, you know, commercial investors, it happens with residential investors. And even internally, you might not even remember, but the further away you get from the actual transaction, like the longer in time, your memory is going to fade. And you're going to literally tell me, Ron, I don't even remember which water heater we replaced. And that's a problem. You know, it, it really creates bad paper trails. And then later you say, okay, okay, let's allocate it to one, two, three main. And then down the road, one, two, three main has two water heaters replaced. And you're like, crap, I chose poorly. I remembered poorly. And if you don't have the documentation to support you, it kind of just goes downhill. So my number one problem is always just the management. I don't think it's hard, but people need to make it a priority. And that's why I recommend annual meeting minutes where you kind of summarize all of the major CapEx, uh, maybe some of the rental prices, maybe a refinancing or a decision to sell or not, but just a real short one pager meeting minutes because as you get older and I guess I'm the same age as you guys, but we've been investing for so long, properties and the years all blur together. So if I have 10 one page meeting minutes, I can look back and be like, oh yeah, that's when we refinanced. Oh, that was the year we had the fire. Oh, that was the year we had this. And you don't have to rely on your memory about when it happened. And it creates a really double reinforced effect of this is a properly run LLC because even if the invoice doesn't 100% match, those meeting minutes can also be used as equal evidence to say, oh no, no, that water heater replacement, that roof replacement was for this LLC, that invoice was a mistake. And so I tell people to do an annual meeting minutes where it's a recap of major CapEx, you know, financing, anything with numbers, and maybe just a general summary of the mood, you know, what challenges that year. But it doesn't have to be long. It's, it's just meant to do a little recap and you do it by year and you update it every year. It's not too much to ask, but it really enhances, I think, the um, professionalism of a separate run LLC. It does seem like Ron that it's like you mess up one of these things and does that mean that you could immediately have the corporate veil pierced or is it like there's a little bit no. of hope you mentioned like the meeting minutes but like yeah. there's no way anyone in the world <laughs> in my opinion unless you've got one entity you're the bookkeeper you're on it every day and you're an attorney like no one in the world is doing like everything perfect so like what right. does it really take to like pierce it and or like what is the risk if you for instance like you, you get one of those invoices wrong yeah so it's a totality of the circumstances it's going to evaluate all the factors so no you, you make one mistake you are not screwed you know depending on the severity of it and whether you double down on that kind of thing with with additional affidavits but for the most part no one mistake a couple of invoices what you're really looking for is a pattern of intermingling or co-mingling the funds. And that's what you have to establish. But my point of that is create more paper that counteracts any mistakes. Because otherwise, if you don't do anything affirmatively on your end, and let's say you just receive 12 invoices over the year, three or four of those might be slightly wrong or miscategorized. That's the only evidence there is. You don't really create proactive contracts, you know, you might sign one or two contracts in the year. But if you have the meeting minutes, that becomes one piece of evidence to cancel out three invoices that were miscoded. And then I would say, you know, you're back in a fair fight. But that's really what it comes down to is totality of circumstances. You know, I think maybe applying for a loan and maybe actually putting some of those representations down to a federal banker or lender, that may be something that could be unfixable that would require you to like commit perjury on on some other form but short of those types of fatal mistakes invoicing contracts you know people ask me 
how do I talk to contractors? Do I have to list every single LLC in my email? And I'm like, no, okay. So for emails, you don't need to list every single LLC. I would just list a property management LLC. I would list a holding company, something at the top where again, the Wyoming starts to make more sense. If you've got properties in Florida, Texas, and Georgia, you have those LLCs all owned by a Wyoming hold co then in your, your email signature, you can just put the Wyoming hold co and it's still accurate to be communicating on behalf of the properties. But yeah, there's not really one single thing that's, you know, unable to recover. You can always correct it too and issue more statements to bill correctly. That's good to know. So it's not like you're just going to sink the ship with one little mistake. Before we dive right into your industrial experience, if people wanted to work with you, they want to learn more about what you have going on the legal side, what would be the best way for them to do so? So highly recommend uh, checking out my YouTube channel, Ronald Rohde Law, R-O-N-A-L-D-R-O-H-D-E Law. That's where I post everything. Um, it's definitely post a comment. I'll respond. I respond to everything. But if you want to work with me, just shoot me an email. I've got my website on there, ronaldrodylaw.com. But that's the way to get a hold of me. All right, cool. So we'll drop that into the show notes for everybody who wants to contact Ron. Highly encourage you to check out his YouTube channel. A lot of great stuff on there, how to file BOI reports, all that good stuff is on there. So I encourage you to check that out. But Ron, I know besides being an attorney, you're also an industrial investor. So I'd love to explore that a little bit. My first question is why industrial over all the asset classes that are out there? Why did you choose industrial? Yeah, I think I started like a lot of people in residential because it was easy, it was familiar and the price point was accessible. But eventually I grew and I had six SFR and it was a lot to manage even with property management, full-time property managers. I felt like I was making decisions constantly. So when I wanted to deploy more capital, I didn't want to buy three more houses or something. So I sold everything, which in DFW, I thought was a great time. I thought I was so smart. And then the prices continued to rise. But um, I pivoted and I pivoted into, I was going to look at multifamily or industrial. For me, I chose industrial because it has longer lease terms. I wanted to be able to set it and sign a lease and just forget it. I wanted less decisions. So I wanted less volatility on property taxes, insurance. I didn't want to be constantly repricing those, requoting that. And so I like the triple net lease structure, which for people that know triple net, the tenant reimburses the landlord for all of the property taxes. So property taxes go up by 10%. My return stays the same. The tenant just pays 10% more in property taxes. And the caveat is it limits my downside, but it also limits my upside. Because if I have a five year lease, if the market rent goes up, if the market rent doubles, I can't readjust. I can't mark to market during that lease term. So that's the beauty or the benefit of triple net is it limits your downside, but it limits your upside until you can mark to market. But yeah, other than that, you know, my parents had owned some office buildings. They were in residential and I just felt like those were too needy of tenants. And so industrial is like, as long as the roof's not leaking, as long as the garage doors work, I felt like they would not bother me. And so I 100% went into industrial and invested in the first deal. And now we have five triple net properties um, in DFW. It's all direct uh, partners equity. So not just me, but a couple of other people, but we're all partners on the deal. We're not LPs or raising um, 506 syndication funds. Quick question on the industrial, kind of drilling into that a little bit. Do you use value add strategy at all for this, for the industrial, or are you just buying the property, triple netting it out and letting it ride? Yeah. I mean, I don't think we're traditional value add in the heavy sense of the word, like, you know, pushing vacancy, repainting or turning units or buying vacant buildings. That's too risky in my opinion. We're always buying occupied existing cash flow. So something that has a tenant in. Now, can we do value add by re-engineering the lease, offering to do work in exchange for higher rent with those existing tenants? Yes. And so I think we do light value add where we are raising rents. And like on one of our properties, we'll talk about that truck parking, five and a half acre uh, lot out in, in Tarrant County, we've more than doubled the income by doing yard improvements. But we've never had a month where we didn't have positive yield cash flow 
And we basically just funded those improvements from cash flow. So before we drill right down into that one property that we were talking about before the show, the truck park, um, right now, every you know, the state of the market is in flux. People, you know, different asset classes are in different places. Multifamily might be seeing you know an opportunity to buy because there's issues. But for the industrial side of things, what's your sentiment on the industrial market today? Yeah, I, I think that you're right. It's it's asset class and even sub asset class specifically, and then your market. That really depends because here in Texas, in North Texas, DFW, we're still on fire. I mean, when the market slowed down, all of the new construction just stopped. It, it just fell off a cliff. And so as a result, people were still signing big leases and they were eating up the inventory, but there was no new supply in the pipeline. So I think we're kind of in this accordion compression, you know, expanding supply and decreasing supply and, and never going to find equilibrium. But in the spaces that I buy, which is sub 100,000 square feet, nobody's really even building replacement product for this asset class. And so when we talk about industrial, this segment is still really, really hot. There's really no new supply to eat into um, the current supply, to expand the current supply. And again, that's a story specific to North Texas, to DFW. And I think the industrial dip has already passed. I mean, right, the, the bottom is always evaluated in hindsight, but industrial basically just hit pause. Sellers didn't need to sell and buyers weren't going to pay high prices. So transactions just didn't happen. But we're already starting to see some sellers opening up and lowering their price and opening concessions because they do need to get rid of the properties with um, debt maturity. And so I think we're already past the bottom for industrial, for smaller industrial, especially if it has industrial outdoor storage, which is like yard space, paved or gravel storage areas. Those are super hot. I mean, that's what everybody wants right now. And so we may already be past the lowest dip of the recession. For that one property kind of specifically, are you thinking this is like primarily an appreciation uh, play, cash flow play? Or are you kind of expecting a good return on both specifically with industrials? Yeah. So we bought this one because it was a good deal. Okay. Just on a basis perspective, it cash flows, it generates positive yield. It's currently being used and we manage it as truck parking. So it's five and a half acres, has about 120 trucks on there and they generate positive cash flow. But the exit is probably for development. You know, we have a building on there that we're trying to lease out at our good rates. But, you know, we don't have the pressure. We have five year fixed debt on it. We're cash flowing positive. Everything is okay to hold for another two years before we have to make a hard decision and we're, quote, forced to do anything. Although I'm pretty confident we could refinance it with our cash flow, you know, with our track record right now, we could refinance. But the point is, you know, I, I think all of industrial outdoor storage in some way is a covered land play because you're not necessarily buying the highest and best use in the future. And so for that one, yeah, we bought it because it was a great basis, great location, great frontage on a big street. There's big box buildings going up all around us, 250, 500,000 square foot buildings. And that's what we hope, you know, eventually that whole area gets developed. But right now it's mostly vacant land with a small building, very low coverage. 6,000 square feet. So uh, that's an awesome deal to be a part of. You, you mentioned before that you're not syndicating deals right now. You're not bringing on investors. So all of the investors out here listening to this will just have to be stuck in whatever, the, whatever investment opportunities they have available to them. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about regarding the industrial side of things or any other key takeaways perhaps on that towards that end? Well, I think that people should look at industrial or other asset classes if they're th seeing that the residential market is too competitive. If the numbers don't cash flow, I think that it's just you have to be incredibly sharp and competitive in that very narrow space. And it kills me to see people buying like $100, $300 a month in cash flow. When if you have the capital or if you have the ability to put together partners equity, because again, that's that's how I got started. And just because, you know, I can write 800,000 in an equity check, it doesn't mean that I want to. I would much, much rather get the three of us and each of us write 
250 each or 270 each, and then we can buy it together. I think the three of us as partners on a single industrial deal that's, you know, two and a half million is so much better. Three heads are better than one. I respect you, Tom. I think you're smart. Ryan, you can help out. I say, hey, will you contact the bank on this? Hey, will you contact the insurance person? Something about our electricity bill. I'm out of town. Okay. And then you guys tell me, Ron, will you take the leases? Will you do this? Check. It's so much better than in residential where you're forced to be everything. You have to be the accountant. You have to be the bookkeeper. You have to be the property manager, asset manager. You have to be the general contractor, the project managers. In residential, you've got to do all those things. And it's, um, you know, frankly, I think it's exhausting and it doesn't give you opportunity to really expand. So again, in my example, if the three of us had the same or varying amounts of capital, the only challenge is buying bigger deals, but then making sure that we have a partnership that works and that we like each other. But I think trying to solve the problem of partnership is an easier problem to solve than trying to hunt for a very competitive thin fourplex or you want to buy an eightplex by yourself, Tom, that's incredibly competitive and risky. And you don't have the backing of, hey, we have a capital call. Tom has to write a check for 50K. That might hurt. That might hurt in any single month if you have to write 50K for a new you know, sewer line. But if we own an industrial property and the three of us have to come up with 50K or even 100K, it's less on a per person basis, which is way more palatable in my perspective. So that's my advice is to just maybe have a little bit more of an open mind. There are commercial assets that are more approachable. I don't like buying sub 1 million. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't think you should buy small industrial, but in that 2 million, two and a half with partners, I think is a much better return on your time and equity versus jumping into the sandbox with everybody else and competing for the same quad or eight plex, whatever, that you make 300 bucks per unit. Okay, great. But you know, you have to do it all by yourself. So that's my final parting. And that's my advice for people is if you think high interest rates are an impediment, you need to get into commercial because you can buy at a cap rate that is higher than your interest rate, right? You can get 150, 200 basis points above your debt. And I don't care. I don't care if debt's 10%. I'll buy at a 12 cap. I mean, that's just the reality of commercial. Yeah, those are good takeaways, economies of scale, all that great stuff you could do in the commercial real estate, the industrial real estate side of things that you don't necessarily get in residential. So Ron, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. Again, everybody, that's ronrodylaw.com. Check them out on YouTube, BOI reporting. Videos are there if you do have that court CTA, which everybody who has an LLC is going to have to be ultimately compliant with in one way or another. And uh, before we wrap up, of course, Ron will be speaking at the Tax Legal Wealth Summit coming up. That's taxandlegalsummit.com. You can grab your free tickets. Uh, we are always accepting clients ourselves, www.therealestatecpa.com slash podcast to request a consultation. And that's about it for today. And we'll catch you on next week's episode of the Tax Smart REI podcast.